welcome everybody to today's webinar on building the L&D department of the future. Um, I'm Michelle Ockers. I am now based in Brisbane and I work independently as an organisational learning strategist. And we're very honoured today to have Donald Taylor with us, Don. Hi, I'm Don Taylor. I'm the chairman of the Learning and Performance Institute. I also chair the Learning Technologies Conference in the UK and you, I was in Singapore last year chairing one of our conferences. Um, very happy to be here which is the culmination of a project that's taken a lot of this year and has been led by Michelle. Michelle back to you. Thanks Don. Um, so in the, uh, the information we gave out about the webinar one of the things we acknowledged was that there's a lot of pressure on people working in learning and development today. And I think this is, you know, from my conversations on an ongoing basis with people in our profession, something that many feel. And there's this general recognition that the traditional model of learning and development is really under strain, that it's no longer enough to have a great set of courses to schedule those, or even a suite of online resources, that we need to be doing more to meet the needs of business uh, these days. So today, we're going to explore what's changing in the world of work, uh, the implications of this for our work in learning and development, for our role and tasks, and the kind of skills we now need in learning and development. And of course, we're going to be talking about how the capability map from the Learning and Performance Institute can be used by you to help plan and create your future success. So let's, let's get underway. Now, it looks like most of you have managed to find the chat function. Um, we are keen to chat during the webinar. Uh, so please feel free to uh, post comments in the chat, to ask questions. We will be asking you at a couple of points in time specific questions that we'd like your input on. So if you haven't yet found the chat, depending on what browser you're using, you'll need to move your mouse and hover down the bottom of the Zoom window or up the top, and you should see a little chat icon appear that you can click on. When you do chat, you'll have a couple of options in a drop down menu about who you're chatting with. Um, it would be brilliant if you could chat with all panelists and attendees so that everybody gets to uh, see your comments and interact with you. So we are gonna start with a chat. And the question we'd like to ask your input about is how your work in l and is changing. So if you think back over the past three to five years about what's currently unfolding with the way you work in learning and development, what is changing for you? It's a great question, Michelle. And whenever I go in anywhere in the world and I, I, I'm talking to people in L&D, it's the question I ask and I'm always fascinated by actually how similar many of the responses are wherever people are in different parts of the world. Yeah, we've got a couple of comments there about the rise of digital, the use of technology, and a little less time, perhaps, in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, Pooja is saying, uh, and Belinda are both saying more technology, more technology, Cheryl is saying as well, but uh, also uh, Pooja and Megan talking about business expectations, and uh, as you said, Michelle, uh, Megan saying faster turnaround times uh, and and this the, the business the, the, there are two things coming through here three things coming through greater focus on business needs that's how Michael puts it um, there's alignment to the business as Bala says uh, and also the sense that there is much less time and also a wider range of things to do than we've had in the past I mean Etty saying that we're more accountable for results uh, so that's that's really about the, the business focus. And, and Deb is saying, look, it's not just about classroom training anymore, wide range of learning options, face-to-face, -face, but also technical and just-in-time options. Also, Catherine talking about data. That's, a, that's one I don't often get, but I think increasingly people are, are saying that, Catherine. Uh, 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 absolutely. So really wide range. Also, hi to Herr coming to us, I guess, from the Netherlands at the moment. Good to have you with us, Herr. Um, and Megan puts it, due to business expectations requiring more, quicker with less, we have to experiment more. Does that sound, Michelle, like the sort of things that you're expecting uh, the audience to, well, that it matches your expectation and, and your experience? It certainly matches a lot of the conversation I hear whenever I'm at a meetup or at a conference, uh, you know, in a conversation with other learning and development professionals. Um, there are also a couple of comments in there. I think Viv commented about um, the expectation around knowledge and learning transfer that is no longer all just about uh, training and content being pushed out and um, things needing to happen in the flow of work uh, so yeah I like I like Tom's point there about the blurred line between comms and and, and learning absolutely increasingly 
actually the L and D department seems to be encroaching on or having other people encroach on its territory, line is definitely being blurred, Michelle. Yeah, and I think on the one hand, um, it's uh, you know it's a lot to take in. Uh, there are a lot of demands on us now in learning and development. But on the other hand, it's a time of incredible opportunity to perform our role and make a contribution in a wider range of ways, Don. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what this is about, isn't it, Michelle? It's about stepping up and, and taking advantage of some of these opportunities. Absolutely. Um, so perhaps, Don, if we'd, uh, we'd like to step back in time for a moment. <laughs> are, you saying, are, are you saying I'm old? Um, um, yeah. I started this business of uh, being in, in IT uh, in the early 1980s. I started as a trainer in the, in the 1980s as well, somewhere in the middle of it. Uh, and I started actually doing IT training in the, in the 1990s. And I worked at a factory in East London that produced cable for submarine, um, that produced cable for submarine communications. And it was a classic factory. It was the 1990s, early 1990s. I went in there. I was teaching Excel and Word day-long courses using floppy disks, uh, acetates on an overhead projector in black and white. And although those things seem quite derisible now, uh, what matters, I mean, clearly we don't do that anymore, but what matters is not so much the objects I was using as the process we went through. This factory was a classic factory. It had an in-gate and an out-gate. We had goods and materials coming in and we had finished literally submarine cable coming out of the outgate and the people were the same the people were taken to a training room on the other side of the car park they went in one door they came out of another door as finished items that had been trained now it's interesting actually a lot of people are seeing this has been quite they're quite familiar with the story megan and neil and other people saying yeah this sounds quite familiar and actually elizabeth is saying people still train that way but i would contend that this industrial mechanistic approach to training where people are objects that are filled up and put back onto the production line isn't sufficiently agile it's it's not using technology smart up all the things that we've been talking about it's a it's a mechanistic approach which michelle i don't think works anymore back to you for your for what we're going to talk about today and how we should be moving away from that approach and we'll come back to the factory at the end and see what they've done tom's point it's too costly I totally back that, Tom. Face-to-face uh, uh, -face is incredibly expensive and it's not even necessarily very effective. Once it was the only way we could do it. This was before the World Wide Web effectively um, became valuable. Well, we don't have to do it anymore. But what should we be doing? Michelle, over to you. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about what 21st century work looks like and what some of the trends are that are impacting how we work in learning and development. What that means for us as learning and development professionals in the 21st century and some of the ways that you can make the shift from where you are now to where you need to be to be effective in this new world of work and learning and development. So let's start by looking at work in the 21st century. So when we started looking at refreshing the capability map, you, you may be aware that the capability map was first developed by the Learning and Performance Institute in 2012. So it had been six years since it had been refreshed. And in that time, over 3,000 people had used the, the capability map. So it was clearly a useful tool. However, things had moved on in those six years. So to kickstart the process of updating the capability map, um, there was an extensive consultation process, which uh, in part looked at what are the trends shaping work that we need to be able to respond to effectively in learning and development. So we went through a consultation process. The first thing we did was contacted all of those 3,000 people who'd used the capability map and sought their input on the skills um, and the adequacy of the capability map to meet the shifts in the world of work. Um, we also formed a steering group of 20 leading learning and development experts in different domains. So the kind of people, some of the names will be familiar to you, the kind of people we had on that steering group included the likes of Charles Jennings, Jane Hart, Clark Quinn, Nigel Payne, uh, Trish Ull in the UK, who is very prolific in the data analytics and technology fields as an example. So we pulled together all this consultation. We also went out via LinkedIn uh, to, to the learning and development profession more generally 
and asked for their input on the capability map and what it needed to reflect. But in particular, we asked the steering group what they saw as the biggest shifts in how work is done that were impacting the role and capabilities required by learning and development. And here's a list of some of the key ones that they identified. Now, some of these you'll recognise because you've already spoken about them, about the pace of change, um, about more agile work practices, for instance, learning in the flow of work. Uh, data analytics was mentioned and certainly digital transformation um, was acknowledged as a key difference in the way you're working now compared to three to five years ago. So let's take a closer look at a couple of examples, Don, of what these trends actually look like in the real world of work. Yeah, because what we're saying here, guys, is that it's not just about the world of L&D. The, the world of L&D is changing to reflect the world uh, around us and if we uh, find that we don't have time to do things it's because the world is moving fast very quick couple of examples data is of course used uh, massively widely in the world and organizations which have got a first jump on that have done a great job with it amazon uh, is effectively a data company it does a great job selling books understanding the books you've read and suggesting new ones to you it does this because it has billions upon billions of data points about the habits of people. Uh, nobody else can compete in this field. I was talking to my wife about this last night and she was saying to Andrew Dawn, uh, who was, she was talking to the other day at Waterstones, who, who runs Waterstones, the, the book retailer in the UK, um, uh, has said that they, they accept that they cannot compete with Amazon in terms of selling books. They have to get hold of the data in other ways. By the way, if you're a publisher, Amazon doesn't provide the data on your book sales to you. They keep that data. They know how valuable it is. So Waterstones have relaunched their their loyalty card. I'm now getting bombarded with emails from Waterstones, but they're reasonably well targeted males, which understand some of my behaviours. They started to get on the data game, possibly about 20 years later than they should have done, but they're starting to understand the value of it. Meanwhile, if you look at agility, a uh, couple of fashion retailers in the UK, Zara is a small, agile, very successful and profitable fashion fashion retailer that is uh, capable of taking stuff that's seen on the street, creating it, uh, designing it, sorry, creating it, having it produced all in the UK because it's, they do things so fast, it's not worth shipping it from abroad and getting it back on the, and Megan says, they're amazing being first to market. And they get things out into the market incredibly quickly. Uh, as a result, larger, more traditional retailers like Marks and Spencers are suffering. They're going to shut down or at least they're letting some staff off. 115 store managers have to go. And Archie Norman, their chairman, has said recently, we don't have a God-given right to exist unless we change and develop the company the way we want. In other words, they've been insufficiently agile and now they have to be more agile. A lot of comments coming through about the value of data and so on. Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, and I think, I think the, I'd love to hear your comments on the thoughts of this. But the point here is simply that this is not just us guys, but because we serve the business, absolutely, when big trends like data and agility affect the market, affect the world we work in, we have to respond to it and change our data sets to, to serve them. So Michelle, um, next thing we want to look at here is having, having looked at the world of work is to have a look at the world of 21st century learning development. How are we going to respond to this world of change well i'm going to ask you guys another question let's step back a second we could get very tactical very quickly and say oh we want to be agile we want to uh, deal more with data maybe we did maybe we do but let's just take a big step back for a second and say hang on a second why are we here in learning development what's our role i'm going to shut up for a second i'd like you to reflect on this what do we come to work for in the morning let me know in the chat area I'm going to take another sip of my cup of tea. Who just I, 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 capability? Yeah, I love these. I love these questions. I, I have to bite my tongue because I agree with everything that everyone's saying. But I, I, I want to let everyone get going. A lot of talk about capability, which is fantastic. I do like Neil's point, building a space for people to flourish. Um, effective learning. Yes, I would agree with that. Absolutely, Catherine. Inspire others to develop. Simone, I love that. What a great message. Potential. Tom, could you say more about Tom? Uh, Fiona, facilitate. 
I like that. What, what are we facilitating, Fiona? Belinda says, give people a brightness of future. A lot of people focus on the individual, but I noticed that Dai says support company goals, shareholders, and employees' careers. So Dai saying that we've got more than one stakeholder group effectively that we're, we're responsible to. And Bala saying, interestingly enough, also, oh, I love that, build, help workforce capability, support organizational strategy and goals. Michelle, I think, I think everyone here is pretty much saying the sort of thing that you and I would agree with here, which is um, that our big picture of what we're doing is, has a combination of an organizational and an individual approach. And Pooja says exactly that, grow the organization by growing individual capability. Uh, and, uh, Michelle, anything that you picked up here that you, that's jumped out at you? There's quite a few people have talked about helping people to work better, to work faster. So as you say, Don, there's a mixture of the things we do uh, at an individual level to help people to work more effectively to improve their performance and the linkage then to the um, the organisational level um, and of course that real values pull which is pretty common to a lot of people in learning and development about giving people the opportunity to grow to enable them to achieve their potential that sort of thing is coming up as well. Absolutely. Nagaraja, it looks like we've, I've, I interrupted the group of three things there that you were, you were writing so please do keep talking uh, talking and please everybody do continue chatting even while Michelle and I are talking uh, I always say that the uh, nobody in the room is smarter than all of us together in the room uh, I want to share stuff with you but I also really valuable the stuff that value the stuff that you're sharing with the rest of the room so please uh, do keep sending the stuff out and don't forget to send it to all panelists and attendees um, if, so that we can all see what you're what you're saying please do keep it coming yeah, uh, possibly. Um, it, it might be that people are, um, Neil. So yes, that's why I said, please do send to all panelists and, and attendees. There's a drop down. Uh, and if you, if you just make sure that attendees is in that list, then we'll all be able to see it. So thank you, Neil, for picking up on that. I just spotted the same thing there. Um, so my, I want to take a, a quick step back and think about, and thank you, Nagaraja, for, for uh, Nagaraja, could you, could you hit the drop down and just make sure that you're sending this to all panelists and attendees as well because i think you put a lot of a lot of thinking into that I'd, I'd love everyone to be able to see what you're seeing okay um and keep doing that while i keep talking um all right thank you nagaraja here's some paul's cathedral in london um there's a story about uh, st paul's cathedral christopher and the architect was walking through one morning he saw three masons at work uh, one mason and he asked the, the three, three of them what they were doing the first mason was was chipping away at a, a bit of stone and he said what are you doing he said well, I'm, I'm chipping away a bit of stone he asked the second mason what are you doing and the mason said well, I'm earning uh, uh, three shillings a week to feed my family fine okay first man was concerned about what he was doing the second about what he was earning he asked the third man what are you doing and the third man uh, uh, said I'm building a cathedral they're all doing the same task but the third man saw the big picture, saw the role that he was doing. And for me, that's the question I'm asking here. What's the role of L&D? Uh, I think you've, you've answered it magnificently. And here's my answer to it. Uh, I think that L&D uh, helps individuals and organizations fulfill their potential. We promise that we're going to do things. And we promise ourselves and organizations that we're going to do things. And L&D enables us to fulfill that promise. Fine, but we don't get up in the morning and say to ourselves, oh, we may be inspired by that, but it's not necessarily what we do then in order to uh, guide us in our daily work. For that, we need a blueprint, we need a plan and a strategy to help us achieve that goal. What do we do with that? And for me, there are, there are three things that we do, and L&D, as far as I can make out, has always done. We build long-term capability. I think Everyone was saying it. it was the first thing that came off the blocks when I asked the question. We also support short-term performance. And there's been a lot of emphasis on that in recent years. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be helping people build their long-term capability. And we also create supporting foundations. That could be technology that helps people learn. It could be building the right culture in the organization. And both of these, uh, sorry, all three of these things apply at the individual and at the organizational level. So we can help individuals grow their capability, but we can also help the organization build its human capital for the future. And supporting foundation could be helping an individual learn better, or it could be helping the culture of the organization adapt itself to learning. 
Now, I don't think these three things have ever changed in learning development as far as I can make out, but the ways in which we fulfill these, I believe, have changed. And that's what we're here about today, isn't it, Michelle? What are the new tasks that we need to be looking at? Absolutely. Um, and certainly when we think about the shifts in work, although this overall goal doesn't change, what does change is some of the ways in which we're going about meeting the goal. Some of the new tasks which came up through the consultation process, through discussions with the steering group and some work that John's going to talk about in a little while. Um, some of these new tasks are shown on this slide. And what you'll be able to see is there's a linkage between these new tasks and shifts in the world of work, changes you're already seeing in the way you work. Uh, so, for instance, if we think about the volatility and speed of change in the world of work now, this demands that we learn and adapt more quickly. So, the, the factory model of training is simply too slow to keep up with this demand. So, building a learning culture and enabling more continuous learning to be going on in the flow of work is now an important task for learning and development. Um, there was a lot of emphasis in your responses to the first question around the use of technology and digital transformation. People are now working and learning in a digital workspace in addition to the physical workspace. Uh, there's also a wider range of consumer technologies that people are using to connect with others, to access resources, to enable their learning and performance as they work. Uh, so when we're looking at technologies in learning and development now, we're not just looking at learning specific technologies, there's a new wider range of technologies that can be used for learning and performance support. Hence, it becomes important as a task that we manage technologies for learning. Um, certainly interested in what other new tasks people are seeing for learning and development. So please feel free to discuss some of that in the chat box. Um, so in terms of these new tasks then, what does this mean for making the shift into new ways of working to meet the demands of the world of work today? There are new ways that we're starting to do things and that we need to continue to develop to do things. Uh, we're living in the world of Zara now, we're living in the world of agility, non-mechanistic work, um, traditional ways that we just won't cut it anymore. They're not quick enough, they're not agile enough. So as learning and development professionals, we're asking ourselves questions like, where do I need to get to? What does it look like? How do I get there? How do I make the shift from where I am now and the ways I work now to the ways I need to work to meet the demands of 21st century work? So what we're going to talk about through this next section of the webinar is a, a map and some navigation tools that will help you to get from where you are now to where you need to be. However, there's also some thinking you're going to need to do for yourself about setting your own course to navigate using these tools um, and the map that's available to you. Because the answer is not going to be the same for everybody in terms of the course you set. Um, there's contexts and needs that are going to vary depending on your organisation. So one key thing that you're going to need to work through for yourself and your organisation uh, to plot your course is to define the roles that you need in your learning and development department now and in the near future and to be able to map skills and positions to these roles. So it's critical to start with roles and I want to walk through a brief example, a very simple illustration to demonstrate the logic you might need to work your way through before starting to think about who needs what skills in our, in our L&D team to build the department for the future. So let's have a look at how this works. So in this case, we've just got three simple roles, the roles of performance consultant, instructional designer and instructor. Each role is responsible for a series of tasks and outcomes. There are skills that are needed to perform each of the, the roles. And you can look at the capability map and depending on what roles you believe you need in your organisation, you can map the skills from the capability map to those particular roles. Now, in some instances, that may be fairly straightforward. For instance, you may have instructors who only perform face-to-face -face training. The core skill they're going to need is to facilitate face-to-face -face learning in this simple example. In other instances, a role is going to need more than one skill. The example we give here is in this particular case, an instructional designer may be doing some performance consulting, so needs performance consulting skills, as well as skills around design and develop solutions. So again, highly simplified, but just to give you a sense of the logic and make sure we're all on the same page with this. 
And then finally, you're going to map roles to positions and the positions you define in your organisational structure uh, and where they sit in your organisation, how many of them and so on, are going to be unique to your context. But again, there's a mapping for you to do here. So, and that mapping is back through roles and depending on the roles that are mapped to each position, positions then inherit skills. I hope that logic's pretty straightforward. So in this example, the mapping could be one-to-one. -one. For instance, here we have a learning and development business partner who has the role of performance consultant. And to perform that role, the core skill they need is performance consulting. Um, we also have an example of a hybrid position down the bottom, the instructional designer slash instructor, who performs both the roles of instructional designer and instructor. So in this particular case, that hybrid role is going to need, if you follow the mapping backwards uh, through roles to skills, they're going to need all of the skills that are defined here. But the key point I really want to iterate here is that there is no one answer for what positions you need and what mix of skills by position that you're going to need. One of the things Don and I are going to talk about and reiterate is that we believe that all of the skills defined in the capability map are needed for the L&D department of the future, but how you align those skills with positions is something you're really going to need to think through for yourself. As and a Michelle, there's something else there which I, Elizabeth has pointed out, Megan has pointed out, uh, and it's something which is very common to just about everybody I talk to in industry. Uh, it, I say to people, how's it going? They say, well, I, it's me and two other people, or maybe it's just me, and I'm in charge of the learning for 500, 1,000, 2,000 people. And there's the challenge, and Solomon has said this, uh, is, there a, is, the, is it difficult, therefore, for people in that position to work like this in the future? Um, I'm, <laughs> and Cheryl is saying, it's only me for the whole country. Uh, so I think this is absolutely a real issue, guys. We are not suggesting the answer to dealing with the future is to have to go out and recruit a whole bunch more people. Deborah says, yes, I'm a team of one. All right. So there's, it's a really common thing. So Michelle, what I'd like to say is that, no, you don't have to go out and recruit more people, but I think we, you do have to find a way to cover the skills that, that are required one way or another and it's almost certainly by working with the rest of the organization but rather than get michelle off track here right now i'd love to pick up on this um at the end and of course michelle you're going to deal with it a bit aren't you later on uh, in the in the presentation yeah absolutely and you know there are a lot of people who are in small teams here donnie's actually saying he feels uh, or he or she sorry donnie um feels lucky to be in a team of six uh, that we've got ratios of <laughs> two, two learning and development professionals supporting 40,000 people, which means we really need to get very clever about how we, how we do things um, and the kind of skills and roles we deploy. But yet we will come back and unpack that a little bit more. Okay, so what I'm getting in the chat is feedback around this kind of mapping process making sense and there not being one formula for that, that that's something that everyone needs to work yeah. through themselves. Um, what we can say with certainty is that the roles that you need to be thinking about including in your organisation structure or having somebody in your network um, performing are changing. This slide shows some of the typical roles you'd expect to find in most L&D departments of one. So even if you're a small team or an L&D team of one, you're probably performing most of these roles right now. Um, but in addition to these roles, there's new roles emerging for learning and development. Um, and here's an example of some of those new roles. You know, if you get on LinkedIn and have a look around or get onto um, a, an online job search platform and look around at the kind of role titles that are coming up in learning and development, you'll see some of these reflected and probably more. So interested in the chat box of other emerging roles that people are seeing in learning and development. So you'll see a link between these emerging roles and some of those shifts we talked about earlier today. Let's look briefly at a couple of these emerging roles. So that of performance consultant. There is, of course, an increased emphasis on performance as an outcome of the work we do in learning and development, which gives rise to that role of performance consultant, um, where some of the skills are around engaging people to analyse performance issues and opportunities, understand the underlying causes of gaps and identify the most appropriate solutions to shift performance. Uh, so it's no longer a case of just taking an order for a course and delivering training. 
Um, another emerging role is that of learning coach, which is all about developing the skills of people across the workforce to learn for themselves. And you'll see that's something we've called continuous learning skills in terms of the underlying skills required by a learning coach in an organisation. Um, so there's, uh, Don, what have we got in terms of uh, other suggestions around emerging roles? I think videographer was one of the ones that we're seeing in the chat box. And Neil came up with a data storyteller, I think, um, learning and capability coach, a systems coach, a clinical coach, a culture and change lead, says Donnie. Um, it, it, it seems that it's, you get any two words and combine them, we can get a job title in L&D. We need a random job title generator, don't we? <laughs> I think we have one somewhere and it's churning them out. Yeah. So, Don, let's go on to talk about how the capability map reflects both the roles of today and the emerging roles of L&D. Absolutely. So the, um, the capability map, as Michelle said, we started in the Institute in 2012. We defined uh, then 27 skills and it, it was used by over 3,000 people in the run-up to 2018. Uh, we decided to go through a refresh of it and we ended up completely really re reassessing it and rewriting it from top to bottom. It was a six-month project. We had a steering group with uh, over 20 people uh, working on it. We had individual working groups looking at the skill in some detail covering 13 countries and I think 11 time zones it was all managed by Michelle who did a fantastic job of making sure that we got people together to speak people working together asynchronously and and all of that feedback that we got from everybody because we also invited people to contribute uh, via social media as well getting all that feedback into one area where we could uh, make the most sense of it um, the upshot were 25 skills, which you see here, grouped into five categories. And those 25 skills are, as we've said, and they're spread across four levels of definition. Michelle will talk about the four levels later on. Uh, what, what the group, uh, the working group and the people involved, so this is a crowdsource enterprise, have considered to be the skills we need to run a learning and development department uh, effectively in the 21st century so it's a, that that phrasing is quite deliberate in the past we decided to make the capability map simply reflective of what was going on the new model is both reflective of what's going on but also is designed to help people identify what's coming up we use these nine principles to guide us in going going through our analysis of what should be in and what should be out and how we should define skills. And the top two there, useful and emergent, were crucial for us. Ultimately, this thing is all about giving people a tool that can be useful to help understand what they're doing and help them do the job and meet the objectives that we talked about earlier in this presentation. But also, the skills that we talk about should be, uh, at least in some way, emergent. The, the idea is the whole thing should be future proof so that if something comes up people should have said yes okay i can see that that was covered uh, in the capability map we only have a window of giving giving ourselves a window of something like three to five years we can't look beyond that but we want to be able to identify good practice now which we think is indicative of likely future trends now a couple of examples of what we might have included what we might not have included um Manage projects was is included as a skill here, even though it's not an L and D skill necessarily. It's not specific, but I don't believe that you can do. So it's not specific to L and D, but it is crucial to success in L and D to be able to run projects successfully. In fact, in my book, Learning Technologies in the Workplace, although it's not just about technology, one of the three crucial roles in success in running a learning technology implementation is being able to project manage successfully. So you have to be able to manage projects from within your L&D department. There were other skills which came up which we considered should we include them or not. Technical literacy was one and we had a long debate about that but in the end we decided that the idea that technical literacy which which seems like a good idea should be included we couldn't include because it was too broad it was too non-specific to L&D. 
What we did do though is make sure that where being technically savvy was crucial to a particular skill, it was included in the definition for that skill. So what I'm saying here is that we didn't just make this up as we went along. We crowdsourced this from the world. We then used nine guiding principles to help us get to the right definitions for the skills. Now, does that mean then, Michelle, we created one collection of skills which was enough for everybody? No, it doesn't. Talk us through what are the factors that determine the right skill set for your organisation? Absolutely. Thanks, Don. So we've spoken already a little bit about the capability map being a map that you'll need to orient your way through and to use to navigate your way to the future. And we've spoken about um, looking at what roles you need and mapping those to positions in your organisation. Another aspect is to really think about what is the right depth of skills that you need within your organisation and where in your whole, and I'm going to use the word network, in your whole kind of uh, ecosystem of where you can pull resources from, where might you be able to access all these skills? Now, there's obviously a lot of skills in the capability map, 25, and that's already come up as a concern for some people in small teams that, you know, there's no way I can be highly skilled in all of these, but are they all really needed? Our firm view is that they are actually all needed to build the L&D department of the future, um, you know, either today or in the coming three to five years. Uh, but you're going to need to have these skills or access to these skills somewhere, um, but perhaps not to the same depth in every organisation. Um, you need to think through what's the right um, balance of, of skills and at how many people do you need at what skill level in each of the skills or where are you going to fill the gaps if you've got gaps. Um, so let's talk about some of the factors that impact the skills you need. I've put together some of the factors that I typically look for and consider when I work with a learning and development team uh, to review their capability needs. Let me know in the chat box if there's any of these that particularly drive the skill mix you're working with in your organisation or if there's other factors that you also think are important. Um, let me give you one example of how this might work. So business structure. If you're in a large organisation that perhaps has multiple lines of business, and if they're quite diverse, um, you may have an organisational structure then in learning and development that needs to uh, reach in separately to different parts of the business. And a number of, the number of people you have, for instance, doing performance consulting or doing marketing and communications type roles may be greater as a result. So you may need a, um, a stronger depth of skills or a higher mix of those skills across your whole team as a balance. Uh, Rebecca's saying compliance drives a lot of uh, what she does. Compliance is, for many industries, is of course a key driver um, and it's almost like the, the, uh, the foundational thing you need to get right in order to play in the other spaces and add the extra value. Um, the last point that I really want to discuss here, and if you look at the, uh, the pink hexagon on the bottom right, access to skills elsewhere. We don't work alone in learning and development, and we're going to have access to skills elsewhere, inside or outside our organisation. And Etty has raised a point in the chat box there of thinking more broadly about leveraging other parts of the organisation, um, and that our role perhaps is to help orchestrate uh, other parts of the organisation to work with us, which was well put, Etty. I couldn't have put it any better to make the point that I did want to make. Another um, example of where we might be able to reach into other parts of the organisation for skills is, for instance, with data analysis. Uh, and maybe there's a depth of data analytical skills sitting in your IT department, perhaps in your continuous improvement teams that you can connect with um, and bring to bear to do, to do your job. Um, the other thing you can consider is where you can outsource some specialist tasks and access skills you don't have in your learning and development department via partners or vendors. And I've certainly seen, for instance, some good affiliations with uh, external training organisations, with research bodies, with universities, uh, as well as with some very savvy uh, vendors, some of whom are quite specialised in the work they do. So look quite broadly and think quite broadly about where can I access the skills we need and how much of that skill and what kind of peaks and troughs um, of access to those skills do I need. So 
We've talked briefly about some of the decisions you're going to need to make about the roles in your organisation, how they map to positions and the skills that are needed to do those roles, as well as the idea of getting the skill balance right for your learning and development department. Don's introduced the capability map. Um, let's start looking at the capability map a little bit more closely and also at how you can use the capability map to figure out how to get from where you are now to where you need to be. Don mentioned there are four generic skill levels. So each of the 25 skills is described in detail with a set of behavioural statements at four levels, foundational, proficient, advanced and leading. Um, so what you see here is the generic definitions, but you don't need to remember those. One of the resources you can access on the LPI website, and we'll give you a link for that in a moment, is a PDF guide to the capability map. So it provides an introduction to the capability map, but it also includes the full skill descriptions at all four levels for the 25 skills. It's not essential to download the guide in order to complete a skill assessment. There is a tool, a platform provided, which we're going to walk you through in order to do an assessment, um, but it could be helpful for you to have that to hand. So here is uh, the, the landing page on the LPI website. Um, and perhaps, Don, if you could copy or, or drop the, um, the link into the chat box for people. We'll also provide that in a follow-on email for people. But it's very easy to find by uh, simply going online and doing an internet search on LPI capability map. When you get to the landing page, um, you'll see a whole stack of information, introduction to the capability map. You'll be able to download the guide. But very importantly, it's from this page that you can get access to the assessment platform where you can do your own self-assessment. So you can do that by clicking on either of those pink boxes there on the left, the how do you score or assess your skills now. Um, now the assessment process is hosted on uh, a Lexonus platform, Lexonus Essentials. You'll be taken from the LPI website to a login page and asked to create an account and to log into that account. Creating the login, the account is necessary so that a personalised report can be generated for you to use. And it also means that your data can be retained. Of course, it's protected from a privacy perspective, but it can be retained, you can access in the future and continue to update it. Um, so once you've logged in, you'll click through to this particular screen. And what you'll see on this screen is a list of all 25 skills grouped by the five categories. Um, and then you can click directly into the grid. You'll see the four columns to the right with the little stars. Uh, you can click directly into any box in the grid in order to rate where you think your skill levels currently sit. Now, a point to make is that you don't need to necessarily assess yourself if you're going to do an individual skill assessment. You don't have to assess yourself against all of them. Just choose what is relevant to you. Um, one is the um, foundational level. It's the lower of the four levels. Four is the strategic level. And we'll show you where you can access information on that, Fiona. So if you hover over any box in the grid, in this case, we've got the advanced level for curation. A pop-up window will appear with all of the behavioural statements that describe what curation looks like at the advanced level. Um, there's also another way you can access, which I'll show you in a moment, all of the skill descriptions at all levels for a particular skill. But there's a couple of things I wanted to point out here. One is on the top right there, this is where when you've um, completed your skill assessment, you can click to download a competency profile report. That's your individual profile report. Dawn's going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Now, returning to options for completing your self-assessment, if you click on any one of these skills that are listed, for instance, in this case, curation, you click on that, you will be taken to a full page just dedicated to curation, or dedicated to the skill you've clicked on. It gives you all the behavioural statements for all four levels. This may be an easier way for you to sit there and look through the descriptions and think which one is uh, most like me. Neil, we're going to talk about the free versus LPI member. Anybody can go in and do their individual skill assessment for free and get the, um, a copy of the report. John will talk about some of the distinctions between who can access what. But it's essentially a 
freely available tool for anyone to use. So even in this page, once you've identified which skill level uh, best fits your current level of skill, you can click straight on to the star for that rating, just as you were able to do in the grid at the front, and it will retain that self-assessment. Now, the other thing that is included on each of these skill description pages for the individual skill is a comments box right at the bottom of the page. You can use that comment box for two purposes. Well, you can use it probably for any purpose you want, but here's the second <laughs> purpose. <laughs> it's a free text field. So uh, one of the ways I like to use it, encourage people I'm working with to use it, is just to make notes as you go about your current skill level um, and about your individual development needs and goals. Um, anything you put into that comments field will appear in your personal report. But the other thing we're specifically going to ask you to do, if you go in and do an individual skill assessment or use the tool, do a skill assessment in what we're calling a consultation period out to the end of January 2019, please use it to provide feedback to us. You know, we've gone to a lot of effort to put together these skill descriptions, um, but who knows what further improvement could be made. So anything you see, either something you particularly like, uh, something you think maybe is missing, um, something that you didn't quite understand in a skill description, we would love to have your feedback and we'll be able to sift those comments out from your personal notes quite easily. Um, you know, even if there's something that uh, we're not ready to use now, the next time we do a refresh and we won't wait six years this time, we'll incorporate that. So Solomon, you've asked, can someone complete the assessment annually and get a report tracking progress with the various skills? Don, I'll get you to come back to that when we look at um, the report, or maybe we can just deal with that now. I think you can update your skills. You can download a report every time you do it, but I don't think you can get a comparative baseline, for instance, show me what it looked like a year ago versus now. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We can't, we don't keep data chronologically. So if you've, we only keep your latest um, update to your skills. However, uh, that's, that's on the free tool. However, if we were working with an organization to support it, then absolutely we could take a snapshot of the data at one point and then when everyone goes through the analysis again the next year or indeed the next six months it's possible to then compare that data the new data with the data that we've saved as a snapshot we don't keep the old data so as michelle says as an individual you can you can look at it yourself keep your report as a team we can do the comparison uh, as an individual using the free tool we can't do that i hope that's clear yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Don, now might be a good time to take a look at the personalised report. And thank you for all the comments that are coming through about the the tool and the utility of it. Um, you know, the Lexonis platform. Yeah, really, really appreciate that. And yeah, the guys at Lexonis have uh, have done a great job helping us with providing this platform. And we are committed at the institute to making the capability map available for free for um, for people. And Tom, timing is great. Yeah, I, I, you know, we started on this in 2012, and I think we're possibly a bit ahead of ourselves. I think the timing is absolutely right right now. Um, Barla, the dashboard, I'm going to come back to metrics in a second. We've got 10 minutes, and we've got quite a lot of stuff to cover. I'm going to crack on a little bit, if that's okay. Um, uh, skills profile, look, you can get a printout on a PDF of your assessment, which tells you where you've rated yourself and what the skill means. The, the value of this is primarily that you can, of the printed document there, is that you can use that to um, sit down with somebody else and discuss things without needing a computer. Also, it's a, it's a record, as Solomon was saying, of where you were at a particular point. Now, the good thing here is that when you sit down and discuss your skills with somebody, or if you're a manager, you discuss it with your team, what you've got now is an objective view, as I said earlier, crowdsourced from experts around the world that says, this is what I'm at at the moment. And here are the behaviors of what I could be doing if I was to step up. In other words, uh, if you're a manager talking to somebody, you can say, look, Bob, you think you're a level two. I'm, I'm looking at what that means in terms of observable behavior. Looks more like you're a level one, but we only have to improve your uh, abilities in two or three areas to get you from a one to a two. How can we do that? And we'll talk in a second, and Michelle will talk about how we can do that. Um, uh, is there a plan to review the current 25 skills in the future? 
for Yes, Megan, uh, we got the we, we've got that booked in for 2020, uh, and <laughs> it, it was a bit of a slog, but we are committed to doing it again. Um, if you're a, so, the first thing that report is available to everybody for free. If you're a member of the institute, you can get this benchmark report, which shows your assessment. <laughs> Excuse me for the fictitious woman Wendy Hayer, uh, that's her self-assessment of her skills. And you can see it's got a benchmark. The benchmark is everybody who's done an assessment against the capability map, how does her assessment vary against that? Now, that's useful to an extent. But if you're running a team and you want to see how you, you could develop yourself for particular roles within the team, then there's a third level of, of work we can do, which is not free, which is part of the consulting service that the Institute offers. And, and excuse me, I'm just going to jump, I'm jumping forward here slightly to give Michelle time to wrap up with and share some of her experiences that she's gone through. Um, here we can see some diagrams of um, how Wendy Hayer's personal self-assessment maps against a defined role level for a task in her organization. You can see there are two, two particular roles here, administration and content delivery. The orange line is her individual skill. The blue line is the role mapping. And the reason why I say, in other words, how much skill you need at what level for a particular role. And you can see here that that is something that is currently done individually for each organization. And I don't think it's possible to do it in any other way. So in other words, this has to be a consulting engagement where we come in and help define what the roles level, what the level of skill required for each role is and which skills are required because it's not normally all 25. It might be six, seven or eight or even three. Um, you can see here on the left hand side, Wendy is overqualified for the, for the administration job. On the right hand side, she is overqualified in some respects for content delivery but she's very close to it. And if she just boosts herself up on one skill, facilitating live virtual learning, she'll be able to deliver that skill and, uh, to, sorry, deliver that role. And so there's probably some form of learning intervention she can do to get herself up to speed on that particular skill. I'm very, very quick and quickly, and I, I can see there's a whole bunch of um, stuff, uh, uh, questions coming through. There's one that I'm going to look at here from Neil, which is very important. He says, it doesn't seem very technical or digital at the top level. And no, that is, the, that is deliberate. We don't go into a great deal of technical detail, Neil, for, for very good reason, which is that if we did, we would have to be constantly revising this. And also there would be some things that were excluded. We simply couldn't cover all the bases technically. As time goes by, the level of detail will increase. And we can see that happening in the next couple of years. Right now it isn't. But yes, um, it, okay. In addition to that, I'll just mention um, yep. working closely with the working groups defining these skills, where you'll see when you look at the detailed skill descriptions, a lot of technical know how, um, digital components of the skills embedded in, in the more detailed skill descriptions as well. True. And Fiona, yeah, it is referred to um, in Towards Maturity, and you know, I, I'm working quite closely with Laura Overton on this. Uh, we've, and I'm, I'm pushing slightly because I'm aware that we're very tight on time. Um, at the, we looked at the individual level. I want to look very quickly at the overall team level. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a view of what the current heat map is of the skills in a particular organization. As happens, that's 40 people, uh, fictitious people uh, in my uh, example file. And you can see their, very con their skills are very concentrated in two areas around developing, uh, creating and managing content and facilitating face-to-face -face delivery. The same skills roughly spread out in a better way to give better coverage would be the generic state we've got in the middle. Working with a consultant who can help ask the right questions and draw out the best future state or necessarily best future state but one future state for the organization enables us to get to a planned future state which enables us to say well combining where we are now with what we should be like in the future here's one view of where we could get to it does require a greater overall skill level that will require some learning interventions right let's put together a training or sorry a development 
development plan for your organization. Uh, I come from a training background. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, Michelle, let's talk us through how you in the past have developed teams using this data. So I'm going to keep this pretty brief. I'm happy to provide more detail if anyone's interested. Um, one of the things that um, I have done when I've been working with the capability map at a team level is to figure out what the priority skills are to needed to be developed in the team. Um, and normally I would look at our strategy and plan of work for the coming year and figure out where our gaps were versus what was most essential and say, let's focus on these as priority skills. Um, there's also a couple of foundational skills in the capability map, which are kind of a key to help you develop whatever your other priority skills are. There's one skill called develop L&D capability, and there's another develop continuous learning skills. And I'm a firm believer that in order for us to be able to support others to develop their own continuous learning skills, we need to have them for ourselves. Um, so having identified a set of priority skills that need developing, um, it's a matter then of defining how we're going to develop those. And of course, many of you will be familiar with the education experience exposure model, or uh, which is sort of derived from the 7 in 2010. Um, so what I have done in the past is to allocate priority skills to small working groups within the teams I've worked with uh, and task them to go away and figure out using that education experience exposure model, how might we as a team develop these key skills? Here's a short example, a real world example around data analysis development as a priority skill in one team that I worked with. The, the little working group that looked at this identified eight key systems in our organisation that data could be used to gain insight into performance issues and opportunities, mostly operational systems as well as, as well as our learning management system. The team as a whole needed to build both data analysis skills as well as skills in using those specific systems. So you can see here the plan was to complete an online data analysis course as a group. Um, we allocated two people for each one of these systems and gave them the task of learning how to use the system using whatever resources they could find and building relationships with subject matter experts. And then we worked together on real data analysis projects. We identified performance issues we needed to work on and undertook the data analysis as a team. So this is an example of um, how in the past I've approached uh, developing skills in the flow of work across the team. But, you know, there's many ways you could go about this. I've just found this particularly effective to give the team ownership of coming up with the development plan and driving the development plan. Um, one other point I'd like to touch on is uh, if, with regard to the team assessment, it is more complex doing a team assessment than an individual assessment. Uh, Don spoke um, a little while ago about two of the core elements of the team assessment and the service, the consulting service that the LPI provides to support team assessment. He looked at the data collection and some of the things you get out of the skills report. Um, but there's quite a, a bit of other thinking and alignment that needs to go into doing an effective team assessment to set yourself up to meet your strategy and work plan, for instance. So the goal of the consulting process is to help you derive insights in how your current capability aligns with what's needed for your learning strategy, your culture goals, your work plan, and then provide some strategic advice regarding your action planning to address whatever gaps you have. So if you're curious to know more about this team-based assessment, um, we are going to be getting Don up late at night. We'll keep him up late at night next time instead of early in the morning. I'm returning from Vegas. Um, and uh, on the 13th of November, if you want to hold the date, we'll talk more about what's involved and show you through that process of the team assessment. If you're really keen to get going with the team assessment, I just ask you to hold off until we've had the opportunity to show you through the whole process. But by all means, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll, you've got my contact details. I'll send out a follow-up email. Uh, and... Um, let me know of your interest uh, so that we can make sure you're filled in on the process uh, and get the opportunity to really think through carefully how to set that up for success. Now, we're running out of time. Um, I've noted a stack of questions. I think, Don, what I'd like to do is pull all those questions out and reply in a follow-up email to everyone um, because we did run out of time to deal with some of the really good questions there. Sounds brilliant. Um, I 
and I would also add, Michelle, thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions. It's been it's been absolutely great. Here's the here's the URL again for the um, for the webinar. I'm going to keep dropping that in as the, as the, as as it keeps scrolling through. And Di, uh, thank you. Just the tip of the iceberg. You're not kidding. It's really. Um, it's really great. Now, look, we've got a question from Bala. How can we send further questions? I'm just going to push on very quickly. Look, I, I started with this view of the factory. Guess what? That factory doesn't exist anymore. Of course, they're not making stuff there anymore. They're making stuff in a new location. Very efficiently, it's a high-tech company, 146 years old, but they're still doing good stuff. This is what the site looks like now. It's real estate. It's in London. It's by the river. Of course, the factory's come down and new apartments have gone up in its place it's a bright new future listen guys if a traditional manufacturing company one and a half centuries old can change itself to adapt to the current state of things so i hope can we uh, i'm very much looking forward to working with you um, to build the learning and development department of the future and there are our details for email emailing us and staying in contact uh it, michelle is in uh, uh, Australia, I'm in the UK, wherever you are, please stay in touch. Thank you very much for all of your thoughts. The link for the webinar for tomorrow, uh, oh, sorry, the link for the webinar, um, Michelle, um, Cheryl is asking, uh, how does she register for the webinar? Any, can you help with that? Um, I, I will send out an invitation to everybody who was here to register for the webinar on the 13th, as well as, uh, you know, feature it, um, promote it through uh, LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, and yes, some people have asked about a recording. I will send you a recording um, of today's session as well. Guys, it's been a real pleasure being with you. And um, it, it, uh, what inspires me at the end of a long process, and this has been six years in the making, is seeing this enthusiasm, this positivity that we get from the community makes everything worthwhile. Thank you so much. Guys, look forward to seeing you uh, either tomorrow uh, on the next time I'm running this webinar or in a month's time when we'll be doing the webinar on the 13th of November with Michelle. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone.